Algebraic geometry is the cornerstone of modern mathematics because of its connections to several key areas. But did you know that there were six discoveries without which algebraic geometry would be impossible? We go back to the 1600s to the Zargas theorem, part of projective geometry, where the roots of algebraic geometry lie. To understand what it is, begin by drawing two triangles. Label the vertices of the first triangle A, B, and C, and the vertices of the second triangle A', prime, B', prime, and C'. Prime. Draw lines connecting the corresponding vertices of the two triangles, so from A to A', prime, from B to B', prime, and from C to C'. Prime. If the Zargas' theorem holds, which it will if the triangles are in a special position called perspective from a point, all the lines should meet at a single point known as the center of perspectivity, which we label P. Now, extend the sides of each triangle to meet the corresponding extended sides of the other triangle. Extend AB to meet A'B', prime B'C prime, B to meet B'C', prime C prime, and CA to meet C'A'. Prime prime, and label each intersection point. According to this theorem, the points P, Q, and R will lie on a straight line, known as the axis of perspectivity. But projective geometry did not stop there. About 30 years later came Pascal's hexagramum mysticum theorem, which showed deeper implications in the studies of properties of conic sections and the relationship between points and lines. To understand how, draw a conic section, which can be a circle for simplicity. Pick six random points on the boundary of the circle. As long as they are distinct, they will form a hexagon, which is not necessarily regular. Label them A, B, C, D, E, and F. Let's keep the order of A being the first and F the last. Now we draw a line through the points A and B. We likewise do that with D and E. We see that the two lines intersect, and we label the intersection X. We do the same thing with points B, C, and E, F. They also intersect, and we label the intersection point Y. Lastly, we pass a line through CD and FA. Their intersection is a long way away, but does occur, and we label it Z. According to Pascal, the X, Y, and Z will have a straight line going through them. This is known as Pascal's line. But here's a fun fact. There are actually 60 different ways of connecting the lines, resulting in 60 different Pascal's lines. The point is, no matter how you connect them, Pascal's line will pass somewhere. If you're enjoying this video, don't forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. But initial geometric concepts lacked a formal algebraic structure, leading for a need for a more rigorous mathematical framework. This leads us to elimination theory. Elimination theory is basically simplification, but there are some interesting things we can learn. Let's say we have the line y equals mx plus b prime and the parabola y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. We want to determine their points of intersection by eliminating y and solving for x. Hence, replace the value of y in the parabola equation with that given by the line mx plus b prime, which is going to be equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. Collect all the terms on one side of the equation to create a single polynomial equation. ax squared plus b minus mx plus c minus b prime equals zero. Here, ax squared plus px plus q equals zero is a general quadratic equation, where p equals b minus m, the combined coefficient of x, and q is c minus b prime, the constant term after rearranging. Usually, we would solve it with a quadratic formula, formalized by Descartes in the mid-17th century. This invention was, of course, incredibly important. But, just for fun, how would mathematicians solve it before the quadratic formula? Well, they would have to reason geometrically or algebraically in order to find whether the line intersects the parabola. If the discriminant p squared minus 4aq is positive, the roots are real and the intersection exists. If it is zero, the line is tangent to the parabola. If negative, there is no intersection. Scholars of the time might have attempted to factorize the equation manually, if possible. Or maybe they might have used numerical approximations to estimate the roots. For example, 
Imagine y equals x plus 1, a line, and y equals x squared plus 2x plus 3, a parabola. Equate the line to the parabola. And then, rearranging the terms, we get x squared plus x plus 2 equals 0. We would usually use the discriminant formula here, delta equals b squared minus 4ac. But assuming that they didn't have that yet, mathematicians would have attempted to solve it by completing the square, for example, which would be rewritten as x squared plus x equals minus 2. Add 1 fourth to both sides. And then simplify it. The left-hand side represents the square of a number, which cannot be negative. Therefore, the equation has no solutions, and it means that the line does not intersect the parabola. This method is indeed much more powerful than the one before it to compute things, but it is still computationally intensive and very complex. Thus, in the early 19th century, mathematicians sought to generalize methods to solve polynomial equations, bringing forth abstract algebra. The first and simplest type is this. Solving the equation means finding the values of x that make the equation true. These values are called roots. To find these roots, mathematicians found this quadratic formula. Then when it's a cubic equation, mathematicians found this, quite long and complicated formula. By the time they got to cortex, this even more complicated quartic formula was found. By the time of Abel and Galois, solutions for quadratic, cubic, and quartic equations were well established using radicals, or expressions involving roots. However, Abel and later Galois proved that the general quintic, or the degree 5 polynomial, cannot be solved this way. There is no such formula for quintic roots. How to prove that is a whole explanation in itself, and if you're curious, leave a comment below. Although we did make a brief explanation in this video here, which we linked in the description. Abstract algebra solved many theoretical problems, but didn't address geometric intuition and visualization, crucial for understanding the structure of solutions, which is where birational geometry comes in. One concept within it is stereographic projection, which is a way to map points on a circle or a sphere in higher dimensions to points on a line or a plane. This mapping helps us relate the geometry of a curved object, like a circle, to a simpler flat object, like a line. Consider the unit circle in the plane given by the equation x squared plus z squared equals 1. The circle lies in the xz plane, centered at the origin 0, 0, with a radius of 1. In this diagram, there is a north pole, which is the projection point from which we will construct a birational map. Now, Pick any point P with coordinates x, z on the circle, and draw a straight line from n through P. Extend this line until it intersects the x-axis. The coordinates of P' prime can be determined by solving the equation of the line for where it intersects z equals 0. So P on the circle maps to P' prime on the line using this formula. From a point P' prime with coordinates x prime 0, we can reverse the projection to find the corresponding point P with coordinates x, z on the circle. These are the inverse formulas. The stereographic projection shows that every point on the circle, except for the North Pole, can be mapped to a unique point on the line, and vice versa. The mapping and its inverse are given by rational functions, so fractions of polynomials, which makes the circle and the line birationally equivalent in algebraic geometry. Here's the thing though, birational geometry lacked the tools to analyze complex structures and local properties of surfaces in higher dimensions, particularly in terms of their topology and complex analytic properties, which is what Riemann surfaces and topology address. Blowing up and blowing down are operations in algebraic geometry that are particularly significant in the study of surfaces. We have a space, A2, which is a 2D coordinate plane with coordinates x and y. We focus on the origin, 0, 0. At the origin is a point. From this point, we can draw infinite lines that pass through this point, each defined by a slope, m equals y over x. However, the slope becomes problematic for vertical lines, because when x equals 0, it results in m equals infinity. Thus, to handle this, we have to blow up the origin. 
By blowing up the origin, we replace a single point with points unique to each individual line and thus create a projective line. P1. By doing so, we introduce projective coordinates uv, where the slope m equals u over v captures the slope of each line. There is of course a great deal of detail, but we didn't have time to cover everything here. If you are interested in knowing, please let us know in the comment section below. And all of these led us to algebraic geometry. Also, do not forget that we always put a PDF link in the description so that you guys can follow in details everything we do here in the video, including all the calculations. If you like this video, check out this one. I'm sure you're gonna like it. See you guys there.